they keep telling us over the radio and TV that, you know, it's coming, it's coming. But go ahead, head yourself into the basement. It's going to take things and just pick them up and toss it. You see it coming, and it's just like a freight train coming at you. You better move. He said, you got to move faster. I said, I can't move faster. I'm going as fast as I can. From the Weather Channel, this is Storm Stories with meteorologist Jim Cantore. It's June 24, 2003, and a violent storm system is brewing in eastern South Dakota. The conditions are right. The conditions are right for tornadoes to form. The Sioux Falls area is about to be pummeled by a record tornado outbreak. Tornado number four or five, not sure which one yet. And one small town will literally be wiped off the map. It's 8.30 a.m. when meteorologist Brian Karstens arrives for work at KELO-TV in Sioux Falls. As a meteorologist, you're looking for key ingredients, okay, for a severe weather event. And this particular day had a lot of those ingredients. They were all there. Karstens has seen plenty of hot summer days packed with severe weather. But he's stunned by this storm's growing magnitude. As we progressed through the morning into the afternoon hours, it became increasingly favorable for not only severe thunderstorms, but for tornadoes. Karstens decides he needs to be on the front lines for this system. Around 2 p.m., he heads out with a news crew to track the twisters and deliver live reports to outlying rural communities. If you're on a farm or an acreage that in the countryside, there are no sirens, so you are dependent upon what you hear uh, and see on the television or the radio. 75 miles northwest of Sioux Falls, Vernon Ferguson and his wife Pat are among a handful of residents who remain in the struggling farming community of Manchester. Well, there used to be a lot of people in this country, but a lot of them have left for other parts to get jobs. And it became smaller and smaller, and then the population of Manchester went down to about six people actually in the town of Manchester. Even though many of their friends have moved to other towns, the Fergusons are determined to stay in Manchester. 51-year-old Pat, who has been blind since shortly after birth, prides herself on being self-sufficient. As blind people, the more independent we are, the better off we are. And I like being independent. I like doing things for myself as much as I can. The Ferguson's home sits miles from the nearest tornado siren. So the couple relies on their satellite TV for weather updates. Around 6.30 p.m., they tune in and hear a forecast for twisters. Just that evening, of course, I'd been watching the weather, and they were reporting tornadoes. But Vernon and Pat are used to tornado threats, so they're not terribly concerned. By 7 o'clock, heavy rains are battering their home. Then they lose the signal on their satellite TV. Vernon decides to watch a movie on his DVD player, though he still keeps an eye on the storm. Well, I kept looking and going to different windows. I, I see nothing. On a back road 10 miles away, meteorologist Brian Karstens is watching the birth of a tornado outbreak. Across the countryside, several funnels snake down from the sky and quickly dissipate. Then, at 7.29 p.m., Karstens and his crew witness a monster emerging from a wall cloud. As it developed, the instead of just a small tornado coming out of this gigantic cloud, the whole thing descended to the ground, basically, in the middle of the farm fields of eastern South Dakota. In a matter of minutes, the twister grows to an F4, one notch from the top of the scale that rates a tornado's strength. With wind speeds estimated at more than 200 miles an hour, it begins barreling toward the unsuspecting residents of Manchester, two miles away. On a farmstead just outside of town, 46-year-old Dan Geyer is sitting down to dinner with his wife Linda and their teenage son and daughter. A telephone call interrupts. It's an urgent message from a relative in the next town who has spotted the tornado. I went outside and looked. It was coming this way. It was coming right, right towards Manchester. 
and it sort of, the tail was sort of back and forth because it was so huge. Dan's first thought is getting his family to safety. Their house does not have a basement, but Dan's younger brother Rex lives nearby in a farmhouse that does. We knew the tornado was going to hit, so we called my brother Rex, and his phone was busy. He's just up the road a half mile, so we decided, well, we better go up there. Rex is already watching the storm. From his upstairs window, he has a clear view of the angry sky. But he has no idea that a twister has actually touched down. The giant funnel is blocked from his view by a dramatic wall cloud. It really didn't look real severe or anything like that. It was more of a, you know, wow, look at that. Rex doesn't want to alarm his pregnant wife, Lynette, who is resting in another room. Lynette is just weeks from her due date. I was about eight and a half months. I was pregnant with twins, and I was having some health problems. As a precautionary measure, her doctor has prescribed bed rest for the next month. Following the doctor's advice won't be easy. At that moment, the truck carrying Dan Geyer, his wife, and two teenage children races up to their front door. All of a sudden, we hear this horn honk and this roar of a motor coming up the driveway and you know what the heck is this now well i went downstairs and just when i got to the bottom my brother-in-law danny came flying in the house and said we got to get in the basement there's a tornado for the first time rex realizes a twister is plowing toward his house dan runs upstairs to join his brother and get a position on the funnel the others remain downstairs lynette thinking about her pregnancy nervously waits for word on what to do next. I knew something else bad was happening because everybody else was talking about the tornado by that time. I was like, oh, okay, something is serious now. Dan and Rex look out the second story window. They spot the massive twister two miles away in a cornfield. It appears to be rotating in place, not moving anywhere. What was happening was it was coming directly right at me. That's why I couldn't see any movement one direction or the other. It was just coming right at me. We seen something big go up in the sky. It must have been a house or a trailer house, but it, we never seen it come back around. It just was gone. Instantly at that point, it's like, we have to do something, and we have to do it now. Rex and Dan yell for everyone to get down the stairs and into the basement. A mile and a half away, the home of Pat and Vernon Ferguson now stands in the Twister's path. Because their satellite TV lost its signal, the Fergusons don't realize that the tornado is heading straight for them. Luckily, Pat's heightened senses alert her to the approaching danger. I have to depend on my hearing. I heard this terrible rumbling sound. I went in the living room and I hollered, Vernon, tornado. It only takes Vernon a moment to react to the warning. I jumped up, and it was just on the other side of Highway 14, which is about 600 feet. We didn't have much time, because it was really coming. Vernon immediately yells to Pat to take cover in their bathroom tub. I hurried, and he was right behind me, and I crawled in the tub, and he crawled on top of me. And we no more than got in there, and it hit. I got on top of her, so nothing would hit her. And all you could hear was glass flying and rumbling and shattering of everything. I could hear stuff banging on stuff. And I could hear, feel the house shaking. And I could hear the tornado itself. The terrified couple huddles together as 200 mile an hour winds rage above them. The monstrous tornado stretches a half mile wide. While the edge of the funnel skirts the Ferguson's home, it slams full force into a neighbor's vacant house. Oh, this is amazing. This is amazing. Oh, this is amazing! Storm chasers capture the moment the farmhouse disintegrates. Next, the twister makes a straight line for the Geyer's house. When I actually seen this thing, and it was coming directly at us. I mean, it's coming directly from the south. It's coming right at, at our place. We really got big since we left my place. 
and so then we were going downstairs and we were going to go in the basement. But at the base of the stairs, Rex and Dan suddenly realized the basement is too small to fit all of them safely. We get downstairs and I said, well, I said, I don't know if we'll make it in our basement. And instantly my brother Dan says, let's go. Breaking a cardinal rule, they pile both families into Dan's truck and try to escape the twister. They say not to outrun one, but it was too big. We knew it was going to hit the farm. It's June 24, 2003, and a massive tornado outbreak is unfolding across eastern South Dakota. At 7.45 p.m., an F-4 twister tears through the tiny community of Manchester. Look at the damage. Vernon Ferguson and his wife Pat huddle in their bathtub, hoping it will shelter them from the tornado's wrath. It was the strongest place in the house. I know I built the house. We had two walls between us in the south where it was coming from. I thought life was over for us. I said to Vernon, I love you, loving. And he said, I love you too, sweet. It seemed like it lasted about five minutes. Just got quiet. Where before that, it was a dull roar. As the funnel moves on, the couple makes their way out of the bathroom. Even though she's blind, Pat is aware that her surroundings have changed drastically. There was a lot of glass and debris on the floor. And I could tell that the windows had gone. I could sense it. I could just kind of feel it. One quick look at the scattered wreckage tells Vernon Ferguson how lucky they are to have survived. There was debris everywhere but in the bathroom. If it had lasted 10 minutes, it would have ground us to a pulp. But the Ferguson's problems are far from over. From outside comes the smell of leaking fuel. Vernon leads Pat away from the fumes to the back of the house. Then he heads out to find the source of the leak. What he finds instead is total devastation. It looked like it was hit by a bomb because everything was just sticks and pieces. It was just a total mess. It takes a while for it to sink in that much devastation. And Vernon's fuel tank is not the only one damaged by the tornado. Every tank in Manchester was had been rolled over and the lines broke off them. It just sounded like a jet engine out there running. While Ferguson looks for a way to shut off the tanks, the twister continues on its rampage. The home of Rex and Lynette Geyer is less than two miles away directly in the path of the approaching tornado. Rex is trying to hurry his wife out of the house, but Lynette is eight months pregnant with twins and is having trouble keeping up. He said, you gotta move faster. I said, I can't move faster. I'm going as fast as I can. He understood, but he was he wanted to get out of there. I was heading our way, and it probably had already destroyed the town of Manchester. The main thing is to, to get out of there. We just don't have time. Rex's brother Dan, his wife and two teenage children are nervously waiting outside in their truck. It was real windy, real windy, and you had to holler back and forth. And holler was Rex, because I was ready to, to get out of there. Finally, Rex and Lynette make it to the truck. They scramble inside the packed vehicle. Turning north out of the driveway, they can see the twister heading for them. This was coming right at us, and at that point, it's just dark, um, black, just ugly looking thing, and uh, huge. I mean, I've never seen anything so big. As Dan floors the accelerator, rain, hail, and flying debris beat down on the truck. The wheels can barely gain traction on the gravel road. It was muddy, and the car just could not keep on the road. My brother's trying to get some speed, but, uh, you know, the weather just don't allow it. And, uh, so we got, we went probably three or four blocks, and my brother says, what should we do? What should we do? Dan is trying to see his way in the blinding storm, struggling to get a sense of direction. But the guyers can't tell where the twister is headed. We were 
trying to spot it, you know, so we can make a decision on which direction we should be going. And Lynette has another worry, the stress on her pregnancy. I think the hardest part for me was not knowing what was going on. I was starting to kind of feel cramping, and I didn't want that to happen. I was trying to remain calm through the whole thing. Back in Manchester, the scene is chaotic as the small community tries to deal with several leaking fuel tanks and avoid an explosion. Local sheriff's video records the first moments following the twister. This whole farm place is gone. We got a propane tank leaking over here. Vernon Ferguson is outside trying to shut off his home's propane. He finds the tank beyond repair and the situation hazardous. The tank was rolled upside down and there was debris on the tanks. And I thought it was kind of a dangerous situation with all that propane in the air. The Fergusons walk to a relative's house in a nearby town to escape the danger. A few miles away, meteorologist Brian Karstens is still following the path of this tornado. Its sheer force amazes him. F4s are rare and uh, they deserve a lot of respect. That's a big tornado, very violent. Entering Manchester, Karstens and his crew find a dramatic scene. As we approached Highway 14, which is the main highway, we encountered several emergency crew vehicles. There were cars parked in Manchester that were tossed uh, about just like uh, toys. While the news crew tries to stay at a safe distance, they worry about those who are still in harm's way. The folks in the path of that storm can't predict where a tornado is ultimately going to go. This tornado was turning all sorts of directions, and there was no way to predict it. Ahead of the tornado, Dan and Rex Geyer are still trying to pin down the twister's movements. You could see the cloud, but we couldn't see the tornado. We were mainly thinking, at that point, we can't outrun this thing. You know, we should probably turn and try to get out of the path. Taking a gamble on the twister's position, they decide to head west, hopefully away from the tornado. It's almost 8 p.m. on June 24, 2003. Near Manchester, South Dakota, a powerful tornado is sweeping across the countryside. Packed inside a truck, brothers Rex and Dan Geyer try desperately to keep their families from the twister's path. It was windy and rainy and, and it was right on our tail. We had to shoot one way or the other. Luckily, their new route leads away from the tornado's course. Moments later, they spot the twister fizzling out over a field 100 yards away. The tornado just kind of got, uh, it got real small. It just got real skinny and got real pencil-like, I'd call it. And then it just kind of sucked up into the sky. With the danger finally over, Dan turns the car around and heads back toward home. He finds his house only slightly damaged. His brother is not so fortunate. The foundation and everything, it was just as slick and clean as it looked like somebody tore the house down. Rex's basement, where both families almost took refuge, is completely demolished, flattened beneath a pair of 4,000-pound fuel tanks. Those barrels, they rolled over and went right, right in the basement. So, you know, that would have crushed us. Once storms develop, it's deciding which one to change. After chasing several twisters, meteorologist Brian Karstens continued to follow what would become the largest tornado outbreak in South Dakota history. In all, 67 tornadoes struck the state on Tuesday, June 24. In Manchester, the F4 twister left only the memory of a town that once was. In the end, the six remaining residents were forced to pack up and leave. Vernon and Pat Ferguson, whose house was destroyed by the tornado, moved to a nearby town. To go back and, and rebuild all of that, uh, I don't think it would really be worth it. Uh, we never, we never really recoup our losses there.
For the Geyer families, life continues as well. One month after the tornado, Rex's wife Lynette gave birth to twin girls. Haley and Heather are the names, and um, we had them July 19th. And they're, they were born small, but they're doing really well now. They're growing. We're thankful we're, we're alive, for one thing. All the turn of events that happened, somebody was watching out for us. What's one of the most dependable ways to stay informed of approaching tornadoes and other severe weather? We'll tell you when Storm Stories returns. So what's one of the most dependable ways to stay informed of approaching tornadoes and other severe weather? Experts recommend investing in a NOAA weather radio as an excellent warning system. It broadcasts 24-hour emergency information directly from the National Weather Service to over 800 radio transmitters in the United States. A NOAA radio may receive a signal from multiple transmitters at once, making it very dependable in most emergencies. In Manchester, South Dakota, 28 minutes of advance warnings were broadcast on June 24, 2003. For Storm Stories, I'm meteorologist Jim Cantori. Your local forecast is next. And some of you may want to have your NOAA weather radio tonight. More active weather moving through the country. Get what you need to know before you go to bed. And Sunday's storm system churned out some twisters. But this doesn't put a dent in the tornado drought. The Weather Channel Evening Edition is next. Thank <laughs> you.